You are all most welcome to today's lecture in our Taiwan 2021 lecture series. And it is a very great pleasure and honor for me to welcome today's speaker, Professor Jun Rung Ye in Taipei. And as you know, Professor Ye's topic for today is Taiwan's democratic constitutionalism, trajectory and challenges. Uh, Professor Ye is a scholar, a legal scholar, presently chair professor at the Department of Law at Taiwan National University, Taida. After his undergraduate studies at Taida, he continued his studies at Yale University, where he received his doctoral degree in law in 1988. Professor Ye is indeed a prominent scholar, but he has also served as a government minister, both as Minister of the Interior and as Minister of Education. So he knows, he really knows politics and the government in Taiwan, both from the outside as a scholar and from the inside as a practitioner. This means that he is eminently qualified to analyze the democratization process in Taiwan. And for us, it is therefore a great privilege to have you here with us, Professor Ye, as a speaker in our lecture series. So with these brief words, I give the word to you, Professor Ye, please. Well, thank you very much. And I'm privileged to uh, uh, share some of my thought uh, with all of you about Taiwan's constitutional journey. Uh, as we all know that Taiwan now is a sort of a maturing democracy uh, with functioning courts and vibrant civil society also with regular and credible elections. And that means Taiwan is a real democratic uh, constitutional entity, uh, but uh, how it worked and how it transformed from the previous rather notorious stage up to now is a very interesting question, not only for us uh, from daily uh, life, but also a very interesting topic for academic research. Particularly what Taiwan has gone through are pretty reflective to other neighboring states. Uh, and I think uh, it also very good uh, sort of case study uh, for other country with different social context and different challenges. So when we talk about Taiwan, what is our first image? Our first image may be, well, this is a small island uh, in, uh, adjacent to mainland China, um, constantly facing competition and challenges in the region and also in the globe. Uh, maybe people also recognize Taiwan is a very beautiful island uh, with very diversified ecological system, many beautiful natural parks to visit to, uh, but also very hospital and sort of uh, a kind uh, people over there. Uh, good food, of course. But when people come to recognize Taiwan internationally, uh, people uh, turn to economic aspects. That is because in the 80s, Taiwan uh, with other three, uh, uh, what we call Asian tigers, uh, sort of developed pretty well uh, in, in terms of the economic growth. The almost two-digit economic growth has continued for so many years. And Taiwan become uh, one of the typical example that uh, people work hard and also economic tax shape uh, and also with uh, equal uh, income distribution. So people call that, call that economic miracle. Uh, but in the 80s, 
Taiwan began to launch the other miracle. And what we call democratic miracle or political miracle. That was because notwithstanding this economic growth, Taiwan was still under martial law rule uh, with uh, you know, single party dictatorship and the society was pretty much regulated and controlled. Media was not free. And there were no routine election uh, according to the constitution. So uh, it used to be pretty uh, notorious uh, politically, but started from the mid eighties, Taiwan launched its democratic reform. We began with students, you know, gather in front of the Chiang Kai-shek monument, chanting for reform. At that time, there were uh, aging national representatives. They were elected long ago in China, then continue to serve you know, as a representative for more than 30 years without re-election. So there were tremendous crisis constitutionally. You know, although there was a constitutional decision sort of legalized, legalized that, that you know, long-term service. But these representatives are getting older and older. Some of them simply couldn't function in the legislature, resulting in a very sort of embarrassing situation that legislators couldn't function in the legislature. And their representatives are dying for electing their new representatives. So student chanting for reform, and at that time, uh, things turn into a positive side. That is, then the president, Li Denghui, uh, received the representative of the student and set up a timetable for political reform. So that was the beginning of what we call democratic uh, reform in Taiwan, and gradually, all kinds of election, including parliamentary election, presidential election, local elections was introduced one after the other. Um, particularly that uh, direct presidential election was introduced in the uh, 1994 constitutional revision, setting up a stage for citizen participate, participation in choosing their national leaders. And so all kinds of uh, sort of democratic vehicles was established. And also human rights was more and more impressed. And that's the reason why people call that democratic miracle. No, not too much broad shade. Of course, there are some demonstrations. Some of the demonstration was really uh, really strong and comprehensive. But by and large, it has been peaceful. So with dialogue and with sort of opinion giving, advocacy and this uh, political reform agenda was pretty much achieved. So we call that a democratic uh, miracle in comparison to uh, to that economic miracle. Of course, we call that miracle in the sense that it was not well predicted that it's going to be up to this stage of success because there are reasons to believe that it could be failure, could be a failure. But in the end, in the end, uh, the job got done, you know, to a level of satisfaction, not only to the general public, but also recognized by international community. But what I'm going to say is not about this economic vehicle and political vehicle. What I want to say and, and share with you is the constitutional platform that sit behind this political change. 
And I would argue this constitutional platform, this constitutional mechanism serve a very important backdrop to the political reform and the economic transformation. Suppose the political reform was done simply through power struggle, simply through gifts and tax by political parties, or simply by, say, political uh, leaders' charisma. If there were no codification of constitution, if there were no judicial decision from the court, if there were no rhetorics, argument, debate, constitutionally from the civil society, then this political reform may not be stable. So because of the, of the constitutional backdrop, constitutional revision, constitutional debate, judicial review by the court, citizen engage with the dialogue, engage in the dialogue with the government, with the parliament, and come up with some sort of blueprint or idea for the country to move on. So this is what I call constitutional miracle. Democratic miracle and economic miracle are more well known by the international community. But I would like to share with you that what Taiwan had gone through has a very thick constitutionalism serving as a backdrop. I would like to divide this constitutional uh, development into three categories. Number one is the constitutional revision. Number two is the judicial review, you know, embracing human rights and adjudicating the constitutional order by the constitutional court. And lastly, I would like to talk about the dialectic constitutional development by civil society, how civil society enter into dialogue with, with the government and also moving forward to the development of this democratic constitutionalism. Let me begin by talking about a very interesting mechanism of constitutional change in Taiwan. That is the incremental constitutional revision. When, was, when I say incrementalism, that is it takes lots of constitutional revision rounds to complete the job of democratic transformation. Altogether, not seven times. It started in 1991, the first constitutional revision. Then 92, the second constitutional revision. Then 94, then 97, then 99, then 2000. And the last time was 2005. That means since 2005 up to now, there has been no constitutional revision. And there are some reason to it. Let me explain these seven rounds of constitutional revision in the incremental way. Well, actually, Taiwan's constitutional change belongs to the category of what Huntington say, the third way democratization. If we look into the third way democratizing state, in terms of constitutional change, we can divide it into four categories. One is after the transformation, you know, the country go ahead and come up with a new, completely new constitution. We call it constitutional making. Mongolia, Romania, and many states, they come up with a new constitution for the new era. But there is a second way. Second way is come up with a comprehensive reform, comprehensive revision, but a single one. The typical example is Korea. Korea in 1987 come up with that comprehensive constitutional revision, not a new one, but revision. 
But after the revision, there is no revision anymore. There is a one-time revision. There are other countries that do something in between. And that is, they come up with a, a sort of mini constitution or interim constitution, you know, while waiting for, you know, come up with a new constitution. South Africa and Poland are this typical example. Taiwan belong to the last category, that is, revise a little bit, resolving one particular issue, and then take up the second revision, resolve the second issue, and the third issue, the fourth issue, in an incremental way. Indonesia, Hungary, and Taiwan belong to this category. This incremental reason reflect the needs politically of sort of consultation and negotiation. That was because the constitution, ROC, the Republic of China constitution, you know, of 1946 was promulgated in China. So when the KMT regime moved from China to Taiwan, they brought two, you know, two things with them for legitimacy. One is this constitution, 1946 constitution. The second is the national representatives were moving forward with them to Taiwan in order to claim the legitimacy over the whole China, although they based in Taiwan, you know, after 1949. So there were policy that they are not going to change the constitution and they are not going to re-elect the national representative in order to claim the legitimacy of the whole China. So as you, as you can see in the past, advocacy for revising the constitution was criminalized. So after the democratization, you know, the constitutional revision became okay. So they are not going to take up a new constitution because politically KMT is still in control. So there is no way they will come up with a new constitution. In order to move forward for reform to resolve the political crisis, they need to revise the constitution one by one, resolve the issue that Taiwanese people can elect the national, rep national representative. So that is the issue for 1991 first constitution. In order for the Taiwan residents, 23 million people to elect their president, it takes two rounds of constitutions to complete the job for the 1994 and 92, two rounds. So one by one, one by one. These seven constitutional revision all together come up with a new landscape of Taiwan's democratic, you know, uh, democratization. That is, routine election was introduced. After one by one, that kind of capacity building election become very credible. With the improvement and with the test, and also people here are educated to do economic exercise. So let's take presidential election, for example. It's a winner takes all election. Very, very tense when it comes to presidential election. Very, very tense. People take this issue rather seriously. And of course, there is only one ticket to win. And since 1996, when Taiwan began to have the first presidential election, notwithstanding China exercise that missile you know, test, still that mechanism you know, move on. 96, 2000, 2004, every four years, we have routine presidential election. Guess what? There has been many regime changes with 
2000 as the first one. Then 2008, then the, the, the recent one is 2016. So sort of swing back and forth between KMT and now ruling DPP. So people are kind of used to regime change. And because the, 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 the election was credible, so there is an expectation that every four years, we people can choose our president. So President Chai now enjoy her second term. And particularly the second term, you know, that was, that was the, the beginning of last year. You know, she won, she won, you know, big victory and provide her with stronger legitimacy to fight against this COVID-19, resulting in a very good way. So the people sending more green lights to the legitimate government. And that's the benefit of routine democratic election. But this was provided by, you know, wrongs of constitutional revision. The last constitutional revision in year 2005 was a big one. Because there was one constitutional revision that was declared unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court. Of course, we will talk about Constitutional Court later. But that one, that decision was a very, very, you know, interesting one. Because not too many jurisdictions in the world that the Constitutional Court declared constitutional articles unconstitutional. And Taiwan's constitutional court was one. So during the constitutional revision, there were controversies like that. And constitutional court come out and uphold constitutional principles, suggesting that even constitutional revision body cannot abuse your power. And that was a very strong signal sent to National Assembly. Because National Assembly in the first six you know, constitutional revision was the monopolistic agency to revise the constitution. In the end, people believe that the power to review, the, to revise the constitution belongs to general public. And that's why 2005 and also the last constitutional revision take the rights, take the power of constitutional approval from national assembly to the general public through referendum. A national assembly was abolished outright because in the past constitutional revision was so-called elite settlement. That is, there was a negotiation between elites. And gradually when Taiwan become more democratic, civil society, you know, gain more and more their, you know, autonomy and their, you know, idea. So they would like to be, to exercise their sovereign power. So they took National Assembly at that time as the barrier. In the end, National Assembly was abolished through constitutional revision. That was the last wrong. And also con Congress was revised. The seats of the Congress was cut into half. You know, this is the way the citizen penalized at that time, the legislature, because they were not performing well. And then they changed the electoral rule from multiple you know, member district to single district and two ballots and also proportional representation. So now people vote for party and vote for the candidate, district candidates. And it become, it become the everyday business for, you know, for people in Taiwan. So every four years, they elect their you know, con, you know, representatives. Every four years, they elect their president and also their mayors. And it become a very important part of Taiwan's daily life. 
So this is the first part. Through constitutional revision, Taiwan move on, you know, set up agenda for political reform and achieve that through constitutional means. So I used to say that constitution codify political reform and also regulate the process of constitutional change. So this constitutionalism and idea of constitution, you know, has deep rooted into the civil society. Now, let me move to the second aspects of cons democratic constitutionalism. That is our constitutional court. Actually, our constitutional court was called Council of Grand Justices, Da Fa Guan. So this Council of Grand Justices was established by the 1946 constitution and it was established in Nanjing, mainland China. So this court issued its first and the second adjudication in Nanjing and then moved to Taiwan. Right now, the same court has rendered, as I checked just now on the website, 801 decisions constitutionally. This constitutional court has been, has been regarded as one of the catalysts for the protection of human rights in Taiwan and also the regula regulator of political exchange among political factions. The court is sort of unique in many ways. About one third of the petition that the court received was in the end declared by the court unconstitutional. That means the court has declared unconstitutional many legislations, many government actions, including, including our civil code. The court found that civil code fail to recognize same-sex marriage. So the court think that civil code was unconstitutional. The Congress need to come up with a law or revise the civil code to allow to legalize same-sex marriage. And I will talk about that as an example data. But just as a way to show you that this constitutional court actually take up all kinds of issues in Taiwan, ranging from education, access to court, you know, to public health, transportation, you know, land use, property protection, due process, things like that. Covid harbors, you know, you know, all kinds of issues, including international engagement, allocation of powers. But the court, notwithstanding this activism, in my opinion and in my research, is a very cautious court. And I would like to, 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 to term them, turn the court as a dialectic court. That is, court always enter into dialogue with the society and with other political branches by the following way. First, when they come up with unconstitutional declaration, they give times to the political sectors to comply. They give them two years or one year to comply. And the court, the court, when it come up with some something very, very strong, you always have to recognize that there are social consensus. If there are social consensus, the court will come out and say, this is the way we are going to do sort of echo with the society. But if the political parties or, or, or the society are still divided by something not clear, the court will come out with a, with, a, with a decision promoting further political dialogue because the court believe that they are not the one 
to resolve this political issue. It's not, it's, it's beyond their reach, but their job, particularly in a transformative society, is to promote political dialogue. Let me just mention one very typical example that is about no nuke policy. In 2000, when there is a regime change, DPP would like to terminate the construction of the nuclear power plant with the opposition of the then opposition party, KMT. The court further say, in order to resolve this issue, the, exec the executive UN should report to the Congress. At that time, Congress was controlled by the opposition party. So it's a minority government. So the, the, the court suggests that you should talk to the Congress and the Congress should also listen. So the court imposed to procedure obligations, not only to the executive, but also to the legislature for them to have dialogue on the issue for national interest. And they, they are for possibilities. If you agree and you, know, you go this way, if you don't agree, then you go this way. So the court serves as a catalyst for political exchange when the society was divided. Many cases like that. And also this court, uh, it's a sort of have some sense of Confucianism that is because the court was composed of 17 justices with more than one third of them are from the university. Professors, you know, and they used to be uh, the teacher of many politicians. There was one time that the chief justice was the teacher of the president, for example, and it's very easy to find that. So uh, the constitutional court was composed of, you know, many scholars, respected scholars, and of course with career, you know, judges, you know, in the bench. And this is also very, very, very unique, you know, in Asian way. So this constitutional court uh, is function in its own way and pretty much again, more and more credibilities from the general public. And with the judicial you know, interpretation translated into English, everyone can see the judicial decision from the website of the court. And now the study of constitutional court or study of constitutional law in Asia or in the world would include somehow the decisions made by this constitutional court. Lastly, I would like to say about the function and also the operational you know, format of the civil society in Taiwan in the context of democratic constitutionalism. Normally we will say, when it comes to constitution, it's constitutional court's job and it's politician's job. But in Taiwan, because of the citizen-centric development in the context of this democratic transition. The civil society play a very important role in the development of democratic constitution. Starting from the beginning of a constitutional change, it was the student supported by the civil society, chanting for reform, chanting for revising the constitution. And the constitution, constitution is a very important subject in the law school, particularly this law school, National Taiwan University, where I teach. I still remember at the time when I was about to finish my PhD dissertation at Yale Law School, I received the news that Taiwan our government is going to dip the martial law decree. So when I returned from the States and joined his faculty, it was the beginning of the new era in 1988. 
1987, we did the martial law decree. Before that, it's even not inconvenient to teach constitutional law you know, freely. But I was so privileged as a public law professor engaged in constitutional matters, teaching in the you know, university, I was able to say what I want to say. I was able to share with my student what I have learned you know, from the West, from the world. And then I continue you know, to develop and to engage in the constitutional law education. And meanwhile, sort of cooperate with many constitutional scholars in Asia. You know, joining that constitutional law forum in Asia and sharing experiences. So Taiwan's experience is shared, you know, by the Vietnamese constitutional scholar with Singapore. And we come up with, you know, joint, you know, co-authors book and analyze all kinds of, analyze all kinds of uh, uh, constitutional issues. So constitutional education, constitutional law education and citizen participation, particularly through the academic, you know, institution like university and students, student and intellectuals play a very important role to enlighten the society. And the general, the, 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 the civil society after, you know, deep in martial law and democratization, you know, they become very, very functional. Right now in Taiwan, we have more than, more than 5,000 monetary organizations taking care of all kinds of social issues from education to environment, to food safety, to animal rights. So this, the, the citizen groups, they are very, very autonomous and they function in a way to monitor the government and have their voice heard and they have their coalition on issues. And a very interesting development among the third way democratization country. There was one book authored by Paul Broker, you know, writing about in the context of Eastern European context. That is after democratization, he found there is a crisis. The civil society become a little bit dormant because they believe the Congress would do the job for them, court would do the job for them. But in Taiwan, after the democratization, although Congress is more functional and also courts are more credible, but citizens remain active and they are very, very engaged. And this is a very, very strong signal to the society, uh, to the government, and also, also provide a very important ground for the constitutional development, not only political gifts and tax, the constitution need to come out and regulate the gifts and tax of the politics. This development, I call that civic, civic constitutionalism in Taiwan. And we have seen students in Taiwan in many ways cooperate with students in Hong Kong and in Japan in other ways. You know, when society comes with some sort of political issues and agendas. So there are also sort of networking going on among civil groups, particularly in this region. I call it civil, civil constitutionalism. I think I have used quite a bit of time explaining this trajectory and also the you know, development of uh, constitution, democratic constitutionalism. Lastly, I would like to say a little bit about the challenge. Number one, despite you know, these achievements, there are still problems. Number one is Taiwan still facing the threat and also the challenge you know, from the region, particularly, particularly uh, across the strait issue. It's a very, very 
you know, sensitive issue. When we are going to do, you know, things constitutionally, thinking ourselves as a, you know, autonomous constitutional state, there are international participatory problems. And of course we try our best, but still constitutional entity, identity, and also, you know, although we have functional constitutional court, a constitution, you know, legitimate government, routine election, everything is there. But still, we still have to navigate in this international arena. And this is one challenge ahead. And also because of the 90, uh, 20, 20, uh, 05 constitutional revision, nowadays, constitutional revision is not that easy anymore because the ceiling was very, very high. So for example, we have a proposal to lower down our voting age from 20 to 18. But there is a tremendous problem. How can we move on to revise the constitution through the new procedural rule? That is three-fourths constitutional resolution and almost, almost 50% approval of the all legitimate vote in the referendum. Right now, the Congress is forming a constitutional revision committee right now. And this is also an issue uh, for Taiwan. Uh, of course, there are some other issues need to be addressed. But roughly, I would say, we are happy to present, aside from democratic and economic ones, we also have this constitutional development and it is very, very, um, you know, important asset to us. And also uh, it's very good case to do comparison and also reflective to other neighboring state. Uh, actually, I have come up with this book. May I take this opportunity to share that this is the first uh, Taiwan's constitution in contextual terms and put in in English and it's published by Hot publishing. Um, this is a very, you know, uh, is a, this is a good way to understand the dynamics of constitutional development and democratization uh, for Taiwan. And we are, we are moving forward to the world better understanding of Taiwan, and particularly in this democratic rule of law, human rights, and constitutional aspects. Uh, let me wrap up my talk and I welcome any comments and questions. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Ye, for your rich lecture, very rich lecture. So informative, lucid, and not least engaging. It is already, I, I shan't take up the time by making too many comments, but I would like to say that um, I found it especially interesting to listen to the emphasis that you play place on the connection between constitutionalism and civil society. Mm. Um, even as an outsider, I dare say that this is a very important aspect. Of course, something for neighboring countries, for countries in, in Asia to study and learn from, but I would even say that, that I, but I would also say that even for us, for countries in Europe, this is an aspect that we don't emphasize sufficiently. For the constitution and for the idea to, of constitutionalism to play out its, uh, its um, uh, potential, it is, I believe, in, extremely important to put it in the context of civil society. Not, not, not to look at law or constitution as something isolated. Uh, this was an extraordinary lecture, I must say, I'm so happy. The, the only thing that makes me a bit sad is that we have comparatively few attendees, but with your permission, we will uh, leave your lecture uh, on the internet and, and uh, accessible to viewers all over the world, even uh, 
for the time for the, the future. Uh, I'm sure there are, there are still some questions that I, I open up now for questions. You can uh, take the questions yourself, Professor Yeh, or I can read them to them to you. Yep. Uh, Frida Lindberg, one of uh, our, my colleagues, raises the following questions. Question: What are the main issues that civil groups in the region are focusing on in their networking? And how is their networking organized? Could you see that? What are the main issues that civil groups in the region are focusing on in their networking? And how is their networking organized? The networking, okay. Uh, the civil society actually plays great interest in almost every aspect of Taiwan's development, depending on what kind of group that they form. And actually we started in even during martial law time uh, with the consumer protection. So the, the most you know, renowned civil group, voluntary group is the consumer rights protection group. And I myself was able to serve as a, you know, in the board for some time as a pro bono work, uh, but that was the beginning. And then after the, after the, uh, the, the uh, you know, lifting of the martial law, there comes tremendous input into the environmental protection. So many people, they join, you know, they join the, the you know, one uh, issue uh, over the other, you know, of the environmental issue, the construction of the, for example, polluting, you know, a company as a foreign invest, in, investment, and they come out and they have their voice heard. And gradually they were able to change the policy. And also education, you know, uh, student group, uh, teachers group, parents group, you know, they care about their education and they have their voice heard in many ways. So government need to listen to, to that. Um, in also many ways, um, farmers, uh, Aborigines, because we have quite a you know group of Aboriginal uh, tribal groups, uh, um, and they would like to uh, preserve their culture and education. But I would say right now, uh, if you if you are going to ask me what are the biggest issue. Uh, for us, and still that is distributional justice. You know, with the development of the economy and also the success in technological sectors, uh, there are business and also industry doing very, very well. But we also suffer from that, uh, you know, distributional, income distributional problem. So youngsters, they worry that their job is taken away by globalization. And also, and, and also their opportunity are, you know, kind of are shrinking. So they always would like to have their voice heard and aided by, uh, you know, professors, aided by, you know, government agencies. And they actually are very, you know, active in uh, pushing forward for government to do lots of reform in terms of housing, in terms of tax, uh, in terms of land use, you know, like that. Um, also the health issue, as you may probably, you know, know that Taiwan has a very good public health insurance. And this is a very important issue for general public, uh, and also to face the problem of aging society, because we have uh, increasing number of, of elderly population. So how to change that conceptually, and also through infrastructure, and also through budget you know, allocation, is also a very important uh, topic you know, issue for civil society to engage into.
And maybe I should add one input from the civil society also. Uh, over the path of the development, civil society, you know, they are very good in bringing the case to the court. They are very good in doing this. They bring, they brought the case to the court, sort of sending this case to the constitutional court and constitutional court cooperate with this, cooperate in the sense that they, you know, heard about their voice. And, and they actually was able to rule in favor of social progress. And there is also one mechanism which is very unique. That is, in order to send the case to the court, if, the, if NGO can lobby one third of the legislature to support them, they are entitled to send the case to the court. So there are, there are scenarios that NGOs, civil society sort of you know, talk to the legislator across the party, asking for their support. And they brought the case, they brought the case to the constitutional court for resolution. For gender equality issues, one by one, the women group, they gain quite a bit of achievements in terms of revising the law and you know, gain the equality, you know, status, you know, through this mechanism very well. Even the court, in my opinion, was triggered by civil society because it was a civil society who found the issue, who brought the issue to the court. Not the court come out and find the issue by themselves. You know, it was a civil society who found the issue and move on and analyze the issue, you know, in their way, in their constitutional way. And there are also pro bono lawyers that come out and help you know, forming a networking for the resolution of public, you know, controversies and policy formations. So this is also one adding to the role of the civil society. Sorry, I had muted myself. Right, okay. We have a question by Mr. Lars Strömann, who writes as follows. Will we see an internal reform within the KMT after the election defeat? Well, this, we are pretty hopeful that uh, uh, notwithstanding this defeat, you know, as an opposition party, uh, they need to gain their capacity and they need to you need to stand up and, uh, and, and also do well as a opposition party. Uh, in constitutional terms, we need strong opposition party. We are not, we are not going to say that we only need uh, you know, dominant party or party with the victory in the election. So I would, I would pretty much hope, and I think citizens are hoping that KMT uh, should, should come out and reform, you know, internally, and also come up with, you know, re, you know, review their policy, and face the problem, you know, confront the issue upright, and you know, become a strong opposition party, and also join the political competition, you know, constitutionally. That is. That is, you know, general public's hope and also, uh, but, you know, we are still watching and it, it doesn't seem to be very, very optimistic right now. Uh, now a question from a former student of yours, Shao Kai Yang, I don't know the characters. Thank you, yeah. Professor, for your excellent speech, which made me recall the days I learned constitution lessons from you. I want to ask you, uh, do you think that civil society nowadays is gradually divided by the use of internet? That is, ah. in the age of social media, does civil society tend to be affected by the echo chamber effect or political polarization? Well, it's a very, very good question. And, and, and also this is a genuine uh, uh, 
you know, challenge to the to the civil society and also to the governance, actually. And of course, it is a global phenomenon and global challenges. But for Taiwan, because we we gain this democratic uh, reform, you know, uh, uh, and and would would very pretty much value the very essence of the democracy. So we need to take up this issue seriously. Uh, in the digital world, in digital era, we are facing lots of problems like this. For social media, um, many problems arise, uh, expected or unexpected. The uh, bullying in the in the in in the uh, 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 in the social media, and also fake news or fake you know material. These are all very 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 you know. Uh, serious issue, um, particularly when, when you have a routine election, if there are uh, sort of external uh, sort of uh, information infiltration, you know, into the uh, social media or into the internet, and then a damage or jeopardize uh, the very function of democratic election, particularly during the, the, the heat of the, you know, of, of the election. So uh, we have been struggling to, uh, to, to find a way to deal with that. One way to do that is to, you know, build a wall or, you know, strong review, you know. Uh, but in the end, uh, Taiwan choose, uh, you know, the other way. That is, that is to to enhance, enhance media literacy. That is to enhance people's, you know, uh, understanding and capacity of recognizing, you know, the information in social media and the internet. And also, and also building up some sort of, some sort of help supporting system from the society not only from the government, you know, the general public still need to come up with something to deal with the clarification or the support of, you know, from, from, the, from the general public uh, digitally. So uh, Taiwan have chosen to avoid very rigid or very strong control in this while, you know, putting effort into the very you know, function and dynamics of the democracy itself, that is the individual. Individual literacy uh, about, uh, uh, about media, about social media, and also aided by the autonomous, uh, autonomous uh, review uh, from, from the civil society also. So this is one way to deal with that, but this, uh, war is not over, and it's very challenging. And I think this is a good question for all of us, uh, particularly uh, for a uh, new democracy like, like Taiwan. Thank you. Our audience would like uh, you to give us the title of your book again. Yes. Oh, yes, uh, The Constitution well, of yeah, Taiwan, Textual Analysis. Yes. Right. <laughs> the Constitution uh, of Taiwan, a contextual analysis. Right, so, exactly. Yeah. Actually, it's a worse series. From the series, we can we will be able to see constitution of the United States, constitution of Singapore, constitution of China. So so this is a very good series I would like to I would like to uh, to, to 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 let everybody know. And and we are happy that Taiwan also joined. Uh, this series, there is a series about Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, now I will uh, read a question posed by my colleague Lars Varje, who uh, is Emeritus Professor of Japanese and who has also served as Swedish ambassador to both Japan and South Korea. He uh, writes as follows, thank you for an interesting presentation. How has the Japanese period 1895 to 1945 influenced Taiwan's judicial traditions. Well, interesting. Yes, uh, Taiwan uh, had undergone 
50 years of Japanese colonization before KMT government moved to Taiwan. Um, and so that 50 years is critical. Let me say, uh, during that period of time in Japan, there was Meiji constitution. The Meiji constitution actually, uh, notwithstanding is you know, old fashioned, but still guarantee some sort of local autonomy and some rights and some separation of powers. So at that time, whether Taiwan uh, can be, uh, whether con Meiji constitution can apply, can be applied to Taiwan was a very serious issue. Throughout the colonization period, Japanese was undecided about this. So there was autonomous movement from Taiwan to set up local parliament, local parliament for Taiwan and arguing that according to Meiji constitution, you know, we should have won. And that was a lasting issue. And I would say, that Japanese colonization period was able to build to build up some sort of constitutional awareness, you know, by Taiwanese people because of the Meiji Constitution debate. At that time, at that time, uh, Taiwan nevertheless, you know, you know, was ruled by by Japan, but Meiji Constitution should be applied to Taiwan also. So Taiwan people ask for a parliamentary reform, uh, uh, not, not parliament, a parliamentary uh, sort of uh, initiation, setting up for, for local parliament, was chanting along the, along the logics of constitutional, you know, of constitutional debate. And that is one. The other one is there was some sort of judicial precedence you know, they recognize Taiwan's custom and that remain in Taiwan, even after, you know, 1990, uh, 1949, uh, when, when ROC government moved to Taiwan and sort of introduced all the ROC statutes and, uh, and, and the laws into Taiwan. But the court was still able to refer to some of the traditions and precedents for review. When of course this is this is uh, uh, also uh, one of the you know uh, uh, sort of fundamental change to to Taiwan's judicial system you know after 1949, but we can't uh, we can't overlook the importance of the that colonial you know legacy uh, even in the area of the of the judicial adjudication. And Lars follows up his question asking about possible. Japanese influence in the post-war era? Uh, you mean the, I, in, I wonder in, whether- In 1945, in, in modern Japan, has modern Japan also influenced Taiwan in the legal area? Oh uh, yes, lots of, uh, lots of Taiwanese elites actually make an effort to study law in Tokyo University, in you know, Kyoto University, the elites they learn and some of them actually make an effort to return, return to Taiwan and teach in this same university. So I was taught as a student, I was taught by professors. They received uh, Japanese education before the war and, and they came back you know, to teach us. So, uh, and also lots of uh, Japanese uh, way of, of describing or interpreting law, uh, sort of met methodology and, and jurisprudence uh, was part of uh, Taiwan's, you know, current legal jurisprudence. And I was, I, I, I would have to say that this tradition is still there, but of course Taiwan is facing more pluralistic source of law. Mm -hmm. And Taiwan is moving more and more to international, you know, community, but it actually started with a very strong Japanese influence. We are having a very interesting time and time passes too quickly. So maybe we have to round up soon. We have at least one yeah. more question though. Um, Eva Aing, whom I don't know, uh, 
writes as follows. You mentioned the same sex marriage ruling of May 2017 to illustrate the dialogue between the Constitutional Court and civil society. Yet questions of the 2018 referendum on uh, LGBTQIA rights received a majority of numbers. How do you interpret these results and what has happened on the matter afterwards? Yeah, I was about to take uh, this uh, same-sex marriage registration as an example to explain constitutional constitutionalism in Taiwan, because this case is, is very iconic in many ways. First, it started with the civil society. Actually, with, with uh, uh, a, a, a gay couple who would like to be recognized and then supported by, by pro bono lawyers. And they sue in the court without success for many times. And later, in a way, the case got reintroduced to, you know, to the court again. And in the end, was able to make it to the constitutional court. The court at that time was able to come up with the judicial interpretation in favor of them. But you know, in order to do that, the court can't do into the details. The court can't write the legislation for the legislature. So the court simply come out and say, this is a general principle. You know, you need to move on, you know. So our civil code fail to recognize same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. People have the right to equal, you know, to, to, to equal, have an equal right to same-sex marriage. But I will give you two years to comply with. So the course set up two years for the political sectors to come up with the new law. Of course, they were, div they were divided whether they are going to revise the civil code or, re or come up with a spatial statute. They were divided, civil society was divided. Then the court say, I'm not going to choose this for you because you got the right to choose this by yourself. Civil society and the legislature and your representative need to choose this. So they say, whether to revise the, the, the civil code or to come up with a special, special statute, you do the job for us. So in the end, the court, the court send this to the, to the political sector. So they began to deal, to, to debate. In fact, serious debate, including during that period of time, during that two period of time, there were referendums. And that's why pro and, pro and con groups, they come up with their own you know, referendum for public approval. So in the end, there was some sort of backlash, backlash going on. And after the, after the referendum, here comes the real test. The two years is about to come. So the legislature listened to the civil society and people began to have a more moderate position. The both sides began to draw back a little bit. They believe they need to come up with a, with a consensus. So in the end, in the end, the Congress and also the executive supported by general, by, by civil society, then come up with the moderate one and they come up with a special statute to legalize this. Exactly in compliance with this two years, you know, then nine. Exactly the same day they took effect. And I was, I was saying, nobody say this is perfect, but in the end, everybody won, everybody won because, because in the end, this is a compromise between different political branches and also between civil society and their representatives and also the court. This is one of the example that not a single political sectors should dominate and they need to cooperate and also need to dialogue and also need to come up with, come up with some sort of, uh, need to play in the in sort of recognize the constitutional forum. Yes, notwithstanding that referendum, in the end, general public and political sector still come up with the, you know, with a solution. And that's why Taiwan become the first Asian state recognize same-sex marriage. 
Now we have one more question which I hadn't seen. Uh, this time posed by Rutger Palmstjärna, Swedish diplomat and sinologist. Rutger and I long ago in the early 1970s served together in, uh, at the Swedish embassy in Beijing. Okay. Uh, Rutger writes as follows, given China's Confucian legacy, how have the constitutional reforms evolved given, for example, the principle of the five relationships, the Ulun, I guess it means. Uh, have, have, and may I broaden this question a bit also and ask you to make a few comments on how, how you look upon the relationship between democratization in general and constitutionalism specifically in Taiwan and mm. the cultural legacy. You know, so many people in Asia and in the West say that there is a very difficult contradiction between the two. I tend to think that the people who, who, who emphasize this, they do this mainly for ideological reasons. It right. serves their preconceived ideas that their countries should not democratize. democratize. <laughs> so I tend to put it crudely, I think this is largely rubbish, but it, it, it would be interesting to hear your view on this. Well, notwithstanding uh, sort of pretty rich uh, Confucianism as practiced in, in, in Taiwan. Taiwan has moved on and revised the constitution or also changed the political system democratically. So uh, in Taiwan, I, in my opinion, I have seen uh, democratic constitutionalism, but also preserving uh, lots of uh, values that, that we think is important. We respect, uh, you know, we respect the elderly and respect our parents, and also, you know, we love, you know, our children. We we emphasize, you know, distributional uh, uh, function, particularly education, to our youngsters. We would like to build up their capacity building, and you know, and, and also bear our responsibilities. Love and also our respect to the nature, to the ecology, and I think. Taiwan has placed lots of lots of values like this. Um, well, I just want to make one example. Uh, maybe people see uh, during the process of uh, democratic reform, fist the fighting in a Congress and believing that Taiwan is uh, you know not you know chaotic or nothing like that. Well, I would say, well, please come to Taiwan often. And and for example, if you go to our subways, which is very very you know established now in Taipei and other city, and you see people light up. And I have many visitors from other countries that say, how come people are so indiscipline? They line up in such a way, you know, people are so in order. So democracy doesn't mean it's going to be chaotic and for demonstration, student demonstrate, including the sunflower and also mass demonstration, you know, they are so disciplined and they recognize themselves after the mass demonstration demonstration, you can't find garbage, you know, living there. People gather and they have their, their autonomous, you know, uh, 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 you know, call to deal with that kind of issue. They, they set up health, you know, sector. They set up taking care of supporting sectors and they're taking care of all the garbages, for example. This is a responsibility. You know, democracy doesn't mean that you are gonna to be, you know, you know, doing anything, you know, without any boundary. And, and I think um, uh, as Taiwan move on democratically, how to still embrace some of these good values mm, is is some sort of some sort of uh, you know important, you know, to 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 share and also to cherish. Thank you so much. By, by this, I think we have, you have answered all the questions. So it remains for me only to thank, uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, the present world does not often give, give us reasons to be uh, optimistic. There are so right. many terrible problems facing us, but uh, listening to your presentation about uh, the victory really, or maybe provisional, but still victory of constitutionalism democratic constitutionalism in, in Taiwan is uh, one light in the darkness. It's very encouraging. Th thank you so much, uh, Professor Ye. I hope that we will be able to cooperate in the future also. Thank you for an excellent uh, lecture. And thank you also for the, to, to the uh, attendees.
and welcome back to our next lecture in the series, Taiwan 2021 lecture series. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.